I need to uh, touch just a couple of things, uh, if I can get this going the right direction. Uh, if you're not aware, Christmas party is December the 10th. It's a big thing. Uh, if you can, you need to get your tickets. And if you don't get tickets, you might not be able to get in. I will remind you that we're still uh, pressing toward a new building and the cash donations every Sunday are accumulating and that's where we are right now. We're looking at the kingdom of the saints today. You know, um, everyone says that they want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, but I don't know if we want to put the kingdom first all the time. Uh, when's the last time you heard, uh, hey, it's my turn to sit on the front row, you know, or um, I was so enthralled and so blessed I never noticed that your sermon went over 25 minutes, or when, when's the last time you heard at church, uh, I find soul winning so much more enjoyable than playing golf, or um, I've decided to give the church all that I used to send to that TV evangelist, evangelist. yeah, or I'm volunteering to be the permanent teacher for the preschool class, which we need to right now, as I understand. Kingdom values are so different from the values of men. Matthew 13 says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and buys that field, sells all that he has. Verse 45 says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That's a different value system than the people of the world think. One dark, stormy night, thieves broke into a jewelry store. And they were different than thieves that you'll ever hear about, but uh, this is what they did. Uh, they were very careful to not be noticed. They didn't break anything. They went in, they didn't take anything. All they did is go around the store and change the prices they moved the very expensive prices to the cheap stuff and moved the cheap prices to the expensive stuff, and then they left. They didn't take anything. The next morning, people came in and were spending vast sums of money on stuff that wasn't worth anything. It was junk jewelry, and they were spending nothing, almost nothing, on things that were worth enormous sums of money. That's what the devil has done. He's come into our store, and he's changed all the prices so that what looks like you're, you're really getting a deal, you're not getting a deal at all. And the thing that looks like you're, you know, it's costing you nothing, you just got the greatest thing that you ever got. Timothy Dwight, back in 1800, wrote a hymn, a Lutheran hymn, and it goes like this, I love thy kingdom, Lord the house of thine abode, the church our blessed redeemer save with his own precious blood. I love thy church, O God, her, her walls before thee stand, dear as the apple of thine eye and graven on thy hand. For her my tears shall fall, for her my prayers ascend. To her my cares and the tolls be given till tolls and cares shall end beyond my highest joy. I prize her heavenly ways, her sweet communion, solemn vows, her hymns of love and praise. Sure as thy truth shall last, to Zion shall be given the brightest glories earth can yield and brightest bliss of heaven. You may wonder sometimes, I've heard rumblings, why I discuss even some of the things I've discussed lately like the name or communion. And you may think, well, you love the church too much. Let me tell you, the reason I do that is because I love the church that much. I've given all I've got to it, and most of you have as well. If you love it as you should, you want it pure, not sustaining some tradition that's not necessarily biblical. I want to be biblical. Amen? At 
any cost. At any cost. I want to look at uh, this idea of it being a kingdom. You know, there are 53 monarchs in the world today. Not 53 countries that are over... Uh, seen by monarchs, 53 out of, uh, I think it's 198 or something like that, countries in the world, kings on the earth. But we are the only kingdom that has the king. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is the king. There is no king above him. He is the king. I want to give you three meanings of our text that were read a moment ago that I think we need to get this is kind of a study lesson today this is not one of those that's going to get you going outdoors going zippity doo dah let me go do something i believe this is going to be one though that you need it's a theological lesson today can i give you that and you get your thinking hats on just for a minute and let's walk down the path of a little bit of theology here number one the scheduled kingdom of the saints it says in Daniel chapter 7, we're going to focus verses 15 through 18 particularly. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the vision of my head troubled me. He didn't really like what, where this was headed because it seemed to suggest a major change in the understanding of his idea of the kingdom that he had ever had before. And it wasn't really the way he thought about it. Verse 16, I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So I guess he's talking to an angel. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the thing. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, kings or kingdoms, which arise out of the earth. Now notice where they come from, out of the earth. That's significant. Uh, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. And Daniel 7, 22, he says, uh, time came. So time came for the saints to receive their kingdom. Uh, what, what you need to get out of that right there, and I hope you get it, and we're not going to go into the details of these kings or anything like that, uh, that the kingdom is not of this earthly kingdom or this earthly kingdoms. But because of the way he does this in this text, it leads to people who want to believe that uh, to confusion. So what he's actually doing is he's showing you the schedule and the purpose of what he's doing. Now, what he's done is he's, you know, we have hands on a clock. The hands on God's clock are events in nations. So he's basically just giving an, a clock on when he's going to do what he's going to do. But because of the nature of men, because the nature of men wanting something earthly tangible right here, right now, not 30 minutes from now, I want what I want, I want it right now kind of thinking. Then man read this and said, well, if God's using kingdoms of the earth to time this out, he must be bringing about an earthly kingdom instead of something else. And so let me share with you that that thinking continued on the New Testament and why they continued thinking that way. They thought he was talking when he mentioned these kingdoms that of a earthly kingdom rather than a clock. And so when they hear statements like Matthew 3, 1 and 2, in those days John the Baptist came preaching and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were expecting an earthly kingdom to arrive any moment. When they heard Matthew 4, verse 17, for that time, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They thought, oh, the kingdom is fixed to be, and it's going to be the Jews will rule the world. And Matthew 6, and verse 10, it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They heard this. The apostles hear this, and they say, Okay, it's about time, and we're going to sit on thrones, and we're going to be in power of this earth. In Matthew 20, verse 21, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. They're thinking, these will be the seats of power, and my sons will have the seats of power, the one that has the army and the one that has the council of the king. And then when we read in Matthew chapter 21, in verse 43, it says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation 
bearing the fruits of it. They say, oh, see, nation, he's talking about a real kingdom here on earth. And so as a result, when all of Jesus' ministry was over, and they interpreted all of these things this way, they thought the schedule meant an actual kingdom when God's using it as a schedule. So they're still, even after Jesus is raised from the dead, they're still confused on this point. In Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 3 and going through verse 8, I'll just focus on verses 6 and 7 for time's sake. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still there. They're still thinking that way. Do you understand? And that it's because the way this is worded even in this text, but it's also because that's what they wanted to see happen. Verse 7, Jesus answers, and he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. If God wants to make a kingdom come to Israel and give it power, that's not for you to know. That's not important to you. You need to do what you need to do. And that's the tendency within man. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 27 it says this, But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now that's actually fulfilled in two ways. But again, if you want to see it just one way, you won't see the other way because it's the nature of it. So it was fulfilled first at Pentecost. The kingdom came with power. Mark 9 verse 1 said, there are people standing here. You'll see the kingdom come with power. The power came with the Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when the Spirit comes, you'll be endued with power from on high. And then the Spirit came on the same day that the church came, Acts 2 verse 4, and then verse 47, they that gladly received his word you know, were baptized and they were added to them, about 3,000 souls, and so they just continued to be added to the church of our Lord. So it did come, and it came in the form of the church that you and I are a part of, and that's true, and you need to see that, because it had to come, uh, because it says, some standing here who shall not taste death. However, there is another way to see it, but nobody wants to see that. If you don't want to see it, you won't see it. And it comes at judgment. You see, some in the kingdom had eternal life already. In fact, you have eternal life already. And I don't know if you know this, but you shall not taste death. That's what the scriptures say. John 8, 51, 52 says, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. And then the very next verse, verse 52, you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. So yes, it is true. You will never taste death the way the lost will. So there is a different way of reading that. But we don't want to mess you up. I don't want to mess you up. I just want to give you that as a thought as we're flying over this terrain because the tendency is within human beings. And the only reason I brought that up is not to upset you, but to simply point out that the tendency within human beings is to see it the way they want to see it. And instead of seeing this as a schedule when the kingdom of God would come, they saw the kingdom of God being coming a physical kingdom on earth. You got that? All right. Second little truth I want you to see is the spiritual kingdom of the saints. I want you to drop down now to verse 18. Uh, well, let me read 17 and 18 again. The, we're still in Daniel 7. Those great beasts which are four are four kings or kingdoms which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but it says uh, receive the kingdom uh, and then possess the kingdom. I want to focus on the word receive the kingdom because they receive the kingdom first. Stay with me. They receive the kingdom first and then they possess the kingdom. Not of this earthly kingdom. Not his kingdom. But it was received. It was received. Uh, Luke 16, 16 says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. Now, were they pressing into it or just getting close to it? Stay with me. John 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, were they 
entering it or not entering it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 uses this idea of talking about, and we interpret this as our eternal abode, and that's correct, but it also says enter by the narrow gate. There is a way to enter something, he says, while we're here. In Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So there is a way that a man on earth at that time, before Acts 2, and I, I, Matthew chapter 18, verse 3 says, Unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So there was something that a man could do. In Matthew 23, 13, it says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither enter yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Those who are entering to go in. So there was a sense in which, and you need to get this because this is really true. We don't like to talk about it this way because we like the clear, defined mark of Acts chapter 2, which I agree with, but you need to also understand that when Christ came here, he was already king. He didn't need to go to the cross to be the king. He was already the king. And, and let me go back further. God didn't become king, and the kingdom didn't come into existence in Acts chapter 2. The kingdom had been since God existed because it is an eternal kingdom. It is God's kingdom. God's kingdom cannot come into existence, and it can't go out of existence. There never was a time when there wasn't a kingdom of God, and there never will be a time when there isn't a kingdom of God. But it wasn't in its fullness received here on earth until a certain time, okay? So when Jesus came to earth, he was already king. We just didn't know it. And then he was, because we call him Christ, which means anointed, which means Messiah, which means the king. So he's already the king when he gets there. He's already that. And so now we become aware of it. That's how the kingdom is already here. We just didn't see it and it wasn't received. Now in Colossians 1 verse 13 it says this. He hath delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, of the son of his love. Now, there's two ways you can see that really simply, really important. You're already dead, and you're already there. You hear me? Put your thinking cap on. If you're a child of God today, you already died. Colossians 3 3, you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When you died to sin, before we baptized you, you died because you bury a dead person, right? So you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, so you are already dead and you are already there. Now listen to this. And you're already, not only are you already there, you're already risen and seated there. So not only did you die, you're already risen from the dead and you are already there seated. Ephesians 2 verse 6 says this, And raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places. So you're already there. <laughs> okay? That's how you're conveyed into the kingdom of his dear son. That's what's going to be already is. So a meaning for us to see is the spiritual kingdom of the saints, which we already are a part of. We're in the kingdom, and we've already been conveyed into the kingdom of his dear son. We're not just in it. We are in it. Okay? Told you you had to put your thinking caps on this morning. I'm going to go one more step further, okay? One more step further. Stay with me. The supernatural kingdom of the saints. Stay with me. This is tough stuff. I understand. It's a... You know, I have to go back and reread this and think on this a little bit probably. Verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Now, we've received the kingdom. We have not possessed the kingdom. Not of this natural kingdom. The kingdom is not of this natural kingdom, but it will be possessed. The prophetic, uh, the prophetic of Christ 
and his coming and his second coming are in one text. Really great text. You should read it closer, maybe. And that's Psalm 22. I'll take you there for a moment. You know that it's about the cross. Verse 1 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groanings? We all know this is a messianic prophetic of his cross, right? Verse 26, it's not just about that. Verse 26, the poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Not only is there overtones of the cross, there's overtones of the kingdom and overtones of living forever through the word of the, the message of the gospel. Verse 27 says, And all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. Wow, that's a statement. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. That's quite a statement too. Verse 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. That's a statement to think on and ponder. Verse 29, and all the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship and all who go down to the dust, that's when you die, all who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. So this messianic prophecy of the cross is not just about the cross. It's about the second coming after there is a resurrection from the dust and having to answer before the Lord at all, worshiping before the Lord, bowing their knees before him. So God goes into deeper things than we sometimes do. We kind of catch the surface. In John 18, verse 36, it says, My kingdom is not of this world. And then he says, not from here. It didn't come from here. It doesn't come from here. It comes from there and comes here. In 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5, you may be counted worthy of the kingdom. You, now, you've got to understand, you may be counted worthy. So you've been conveyed into it, but you have not possessed it yet. You haven't got it yet. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 1, who will be judged at his appearing and his kingdom. That means when he appears, we will see his kingdom as it really is. Instead of the way we see it here in a glass darkly. 2 Timothy 4 verse 18, and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom so i need to make it to that point which is a miraculous place hebrews 12 verse 28 says we are receiving not we've got it we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken we're not there yet second peter 1 verse 11 except in the spiritual promise sense we're seated but we aren't actually physically seated there yet are we so 2 Peter 1 and verse 11 says, An entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I know that's a little mechanical, but stay with me. Not all of this natural kingdom and not of this natural kingdom, but it will be possessed as an inheritance. That's the reason, the terminology of an inheritance. We are in the kingdom, we have received it, but we do not possess it yet. Matthew 25, verse 34 says, Then the king will say to those in his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. It's been promised. It's on the document, but we haven't got it just yet. And 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, that's the reason it says this. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexual, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But you will. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. But we will inherit it so it's not of this it's not of this natural not of this natural but it will be possessed through the promises of the scriptures God has promised this to us my friend we have already received part of the promise we have received it but we have not possessed the kingdom yet but we will 
We will. Because James 2 verse 5 says, We're heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who loved him. Amen? He has promised it. He has promised the earth. Listen to this statement. Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, I know that's a lot of, you could go into a metaphor about that. But Matthew, uh, Daniel 7, 27 says, Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. Now, what that implies is not that so much the physical earth as much as it is the people of the earth. The promise not only is of the earth, but the promise of, is that of an eternal life. In Matthew 19, 29, everyone who has left houses for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. That's a promise you're going to get. You haven't quite got it yet because people keep dying, but you will get it. The promise is that of the riches of his glory, Ephesians 1 and verse 18, that you may know what is the hope and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So we will receive that. That's a promise. You haven't seen it yet. You don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about it. The promise is also the saints themselves become a gift. Listen to Colossians 1 and verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of of the saints in light. Listen to me. The gr one of the greatest gifts we get in heaven is not the gold and not the big city and all that's wonderful and that's promised to us. It's the other folks we spent life with here. And then the promise is that of an incorruptible, undefilable, unfatable, and and then it's personal. Listen to this in 1 Peter 1 and verse 4. An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. For you. For you. For you. For you specifically. It is reserved for you. So I, I'm just saying there is a supernatural element of the kingdom and there's a promise of a blessing. Can I talk about that just a second? I know I'm pushing you just a little bit here because it's hot in here and I'm about to go to sleep so stay with me <laughs> there's a tradition from the Old Testament tradition of fathers 1 Peter 3 verse 9 not returning evil for evil but or reviling for reviling but on the contrary blessing knowing that you were called to this that you may inherit a blessing in the Old Testament <laughs> A father always, when he received his inheritance, put his hand on his son's head and gave him a personal blessing. You're going to get that. You listening to me? That's promised to you. Your name, your blessing, straight from his hands to you. A blessing. You're promised all things. Revelation 21, verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and will be, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. So all of creation is a, going to be a gift to you. I don't think we got that. It all belongs to you. But listen to me. That's not the big one. It's the latter part of this statement. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. You see, after he gives you all this junk, we get him. We get him. You ask me who I'd like to sit down and talk to, it's him. You ask me who I'd like to spend some time with in heaven, it's him. I want to see you there, but I want to be with him. Amen? It's him. So a meaning for us is it's a supernatural kingdom of the saints that we have yet to possess. And there is a schedule, yes, and it was spelled out and those things occurred with those kings of this earth. And that's all that was, is to identify when we would receive the kingdom, which was a spiritual kingdom, which you are a part of, that you're in right now. You've received it, but you have not possessed it yet. Remain faithful till death so that you can possess it. Amen? So, I know Timothy Dwight said it well. I love thy kingdom, Lord, and I do. How much, though? How much do you love it? Paul Harvey, 
Y'all remember Paul Harvey? I think it's Paul Harvey. But uh, Paul Harvey, before he passed away, he told a story of a guy named Ray Blankenship. And Ray Blankenship, nobody in particular, is living in Andover, Ohio. He was preparing his breakfast, and while he's working on his breakfast, he's looking out his window, and it's just been a, a rainstorm, and he's watching, and all of a sudden, he sees this little girl in one of the drainage ditches, little bitty thing, as she's floating down quickly down the drainage ditch. And he knows instantly that it's going downstream, and then it's going to dump into an underground place where it goes under the water, and then it empties out of the main culvert down into the deep water. And he sees this little girl flailing around. Without thinking, he bursts out his door, dashes down the road, dashes toward the toward where this water is racing down. He's running as hard as he can to get ahead of where the little girl is. As soon as he gets just a little ways ahead of the little girl, he flings himself out into the water. And then he, he tumbles over. Finally, he, he manages to grab her. And then they, they just roll as they're going through this water all the way down and just feet before they go through that culvert where they're ne neither one of them would ever emerge alive. He meant something was sticking out of the side. He doesn't even know what it was. Something was sticking out. He grabbed hold of that, and he held on. He held on to all of his might with the little girl, and he thought, if I can just hold on for just a moment, then maybe somebody will come and help me. But he did more than that. By the time the firefighters and the, the rescuers got there to him, he had already pulled the little girl to safety, and he was crawling out himself. Now, both he and the little girl were taken care of. They, you know, they had a problem. They were cold. And so he had to work with hypothermia, but, but they were fine. And then on April the 12th, 1989, they were, oh, he was awarded a, a medal from the Coast Guard, a life-saving medal. It was a silver medal. And it was, it was fitting because he had, I mean, what you, I mean, how many people would do that, you know? And he had saved the little girl, but what made it more wonderful? is Ray Blankenship couldn't swim. He just flung himself out. Not thinking of himself for a moment, he just flung himself out. That's Jesus. That's this kingdom. That's what he just flung himself out there for this kingdom that you might receive what you have. And then he calls you, fling yourself out. Leave it all behind. Has it ever been that important to you that you would leave it all behind for that one? That one. Would you fling yourself out there that you might have it? Does it mean more to you than all? Would you sell all? Do your values match up to kingdom values? Would you sell all to have it now? If you would, then you're the candidate this morning. We need to see baptized. We need to see you confess the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. We need to see that heart that's willing to fling it all away. We need to see that heart that's willing to go underneath the water and come up dead and alive at the same time. If you want to be a part of that, then you're where the kingdom really begins. Won't you come if you need to while we stand and while we sing?